Welcome to Therapy in the Great Outdoors, a podcast about the business and practice of nature-based pediatric therapy of all kinds. If you are a nature-loving therapist who works with children, this podcast will help you start taking your work outdoors into nature and help you grow a profitable nature-based therapy practice or program that connects children to nature and changes their lives and yours forever. I'm your host, the ever honest, always 100% real, Laura Park Figueroa. I have been a pediatric occupational therapist for over 20 years. But seven years ago, I almost left the field entirely. I was so burned out. And nature-based therapy is what saved me. It reignited my love of my work and I saw profound changes in the children that I was working with. I'm the founder of Outdoor Kids OT and the creator of the Contigo Approach, an evidence-based framework for nature-based pediatric therapy services. I've helped dozens of pediatric therapists start and grow successful nature-based practices through my business coaching and online programs, the latest of which is the Therapy in the Great Outdoors community, Tigo for short. Tigo is an online membership site with loads of resources to support you every step of the way as you start and grow your nature-based therapy work. You can find out more at therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com. Working outdoors with children can be a wild ride. Are you ready for the adventure? Let's jump in. Hi, friend. This is episode three of Therapy in the Great Outdoors, the business and practice of nature-based pediatric therapy. And today, I am so excited to share with you three of my most favorite outdoor therapy activities for children. But first, we're going to do our two-minute takeaway. This is a feature on the show where I share current research so that you can apply it to your nature-based therapy work with children. So the article for this week is titled The Art of Working with Nature in Nature-Based Therapies. It was a 2021 article in the Journal of Experiential Education. The interesting thing about this article is that it is very similar to the research that I am doing in my field of occupational therapy. And this article, I didn't read it before I submitted my proposal, but when it came out, I looked through it and thought, wow, this is really interesting to read because it's very similar to the type of research that I am doing and the research question that I am looking at in my own field. So this, though, was an interdisciplinary study. So they looked at multiple different types of practitioners who were working in nature. They did use grounded theory, which is the method of research that I'm using as well. And the purpose of grounded theory research is to look at a process. So usually in grounded theory, a lot of people are interviewed, and then you're trying to understand a process from what the interviews, the participants in the research have shared with you in the interviews or in the data that you're collecting. Sometimes other methods are used besides interviews, but typically it's intensive interviewing that is used. So in this study, they did interviews with 26 different nature-based practitioners from five different countries, as well as doing some field observations of nature-based workshops. Now, only it's really interesting, only 18 of those practitioners were licensed practitioners. So I would assume that many of you listening to this podcast are licensed practitioners, for example, occupational therapists like myself or speech therapists, physical therapists, social workers, mental health counselors, like all of us working in licensed professions for the most part. So in this study, they included people outside of licensed professions. So they had people from the fields of adventure and wilderness therapy, ecotherapy, expressive arts therapy, and even one of the people who self-identified as a nature-based shamanic guide. So there's a wide variety of different nature-based practitioners they included in this study. The purpose of this study was to ask the question, how does nature actively influence the therapeutic process? So the first research question was, how do practitioners of nature-based therapy perceive and experience nature's role or input in the therapeutic process? Very similar to my own research question in OT. 
And the second research question was, what is actually done by the practitioner so that nature's input is integrated as part of nature-based therapies? Really interesting questions, right? Now, they found four categories as their findings. And the first was that practitioners believe nature influences the therapeutic process. You know, sometimes research comes up with things that were like, yeah, obviously, that's kind of an obvious one, right? So, of course, as nature-based practitioners, we believe that nature influences the process of our therapy. The second finding was that the practitioner's relationship with nature has a role in the therapeutic process. So this is very consistent with something that I teach, which is that part of being a nature-based therapist is to foster your own connection with nature. So that was kind of cool to see. The third finding was that practitioners work with nature to acknowledge nature's input and that they integrate it intentionally in the therapy process. And the fourth was that practitioners create conditions for the client to engage with nature. So something really interesting to note here is that I did not see in this article if these practitioners worked with children. They didn't articulate. Maybe I need to take a closer look. But I didn't see in this article if they were working with adults or with children. Now, based on what I know of the research, my guess is that they were probably working with maybe teens or adults because there is very little research comparatively on practitioners who work with children in the nature-based therapy literature that I know of. So the, the thing is, though, we can use these findings to inform our work as pediatric therapists. The five themes they came up with which we can apply to our pediatric work are as follows. One, to create safety and trust. Two, to facilitate internal and external awareness. Three, to teach new ways of knowing. Four, to role model and give invitations. And five, to help clients in making meaning. So those five things can be done in our nature-based sessions with children. Now, because this is a short takeaway, two-minute takeaway, which is probably going to end up being five minutes every week, but anyway, I am not going to go into details here, but this may be fodder for future episodes on the podcast because there's so much I could say about each of these, but I'm trying to keep this a quick two-minute takeaway, so I won't go into major detail here. But the basic takeaway or application to our practice is that nature herself contributes to the therapeutic process in our work with children. We can let go a little bit in our nature-based work, and we can feel a little bit more free to follow the child's lead and enter our sessions with a sense of wonder and curiosity about what may happen because nature is going to provide. Nature is always going to show up and give us what we need for that therapy session. There are always, always, always lessons to be learned. So... We can loosen our grip on our plan a little bit. I know that we all know it's important with many of the children that we work with as nature-based pediatric practitioners. They need a plan, right? They need to know what the plan is to have that sense of control prior to the session and during the session. But nature also contributes to that process by kind of bringing up things we could never plan for. So it's kind of cool how that works. Like nature kind of messes up our plan, but then also contributes to the therapeutic process. So anyway, this is a really great article. I'd highly encourage you to look it up and give it a read. It has really great quotes from people that they interviewed, and it's very fun to read those quotes because you really get the, the lived experience and the words of the people that they interviewed. Okay, let's move on to the topic for today. Three of my very most favorite therapy activities to do with children in nature-based therapy sessions. So I will try to be brief in this and share the activity, the materials or supplies that you may need, and why I love the activity so much. So that will be kind of my outline for sharing these with you. So the first one, which some of you may have seen me share online because I love it so much, I feel like I'm always talking about it, is giant spider web. So for this activity, you need a bunch of relatively long pieces of rope. It's also helpful to have some carabiners, the little clips that are used for climbing. Make sure those are weight-bearing ones, not just the crappy keychain ones that you can get on Amazon. And then it's also, you can get climbing ones on Amazon too, but just make sure that they are not 
non-weight-bearing. Make sure they are weight-bearing carabiners. Okay. And then it's also helpful to have a knot tying guide or maybe personally know how to tie a few knots. And I'll tell you a very specific one, which is helpful to know in just a minute. But the general gist of this project is that you are making a giant spider web. So you need a small grove of trees with trunks relatively close to each other or very large branches low to the ground close to each other. And you can frame it for the kids that you get to make. They are going to get to make their own gigantic spider web and then climb on it like little spiders. So then the kids just kind of go to town, just tying ropes, wrapping ropes around trees and making a spider web where the ropes are all woven between the trees like one big spider web. I promise you there is no systematic way to do this. (laughs) It's really just a matter of experimentation. And that is one of the things I love about this activity is that it really encourages kids to trial and error, to problem solve, to learn through failure in some ways, because sometimes the knots won't hold or they're t- they will try to stand on one of the ropes and the rope will be too loose and they'll have to tighten it. And you as a therapist can facilitate making the web stronger by maybe tightening up some knots, but really let them go for it. Your job is to just ensure safety during the experience and to support them to be successful so that they can actually climb on it. So it can be helpful with this activity to know how to tie a bowlin knot. It's writ- it's pronounced bowlin, but it's written bowline, B-O-W-L-I-N-E. I think I have a YouTube video on how to tie this knot that I made years ago, so I will link that in the show notes. But it is helpful for you to know how to tie this knot. It is one of the most helpful knots in outdoor therapy because it, it, the purpose of the knot is to make a loop on the end of a piece of rope. So if you know how to tie this knot, you can make a loop on the end of any piece of rope, which can easily be untied as well. That is a key thing about the bowline knot. It is just the most useful knot. I cannot reiterate how helpful it will be in your daily life, not just in your nature-based therapy sessions. But basically, learning to tie that knot will let you make a loop on the end of the rope. So you could have a loop on one end and then the straight line on the other end, which allows the kids to just wrap the loop end of the rope around the tree and then stick the straight end through the loop in order to to get the rope around a tree on one side. So and then you just have to tie ends together to make kind of a line between two trees, if that makes sense. So that that knot is actually fairly easy to learn how to tie. And there's a little story that goes along with it in the video. And so it's it's fairly easy to learn how to tie and again easily comes un unknotted. It's it's when it's weighted, it's really strong and won't come untied. But then when it's when the rope is unweighted, you can easily untie it all the time. It's not going to cinch down so tightly that it will never be able to come out like a square knot might be. <laughs> so this is a really amazing therapy activity. I have had success with it with so many different kids have just loved this activity. It's great for gross motor skills, fine motor skills, tying the knots, motor coordination, bilateral coordination, balance, so many skills that kids need to work on. And yet it also includes problem solving and social skills. Kids start talking about how to fix things when they're doing this activity. So the one drawback is that you do need a significant amount of rope to do this. I will say I don't usually use any specific kind of rope for this activity. I have a lot of play ropes that I bring that are not necessarily the kind of ropes I would use to set up a weight-bearing swing, you know, that needs to be very safe for kids to get on. So you can use any kind of rope for this activity. I find ropes at thrift stores really to use for this, just like play ropes, because there's low risk with this activity. We're not building this 10 feet off the ground. Kids are not going to be using it over time. It's not going to be left out in the elements because you'll take it down usually when you're done doing this activity. So any kind of rope is okay. And there's there's it's fairly low risk and really, really fun. So, okay. The second activity is map making. Now, this is one that I often do on the first treatment session with a group or in an individual session with a child because it's really great to help the children get the lay of the land, to to really start to understand the environment they're in, 
So uh, the only materials that you need for this are some pretty heavy duty paper. It's really helpful to have thicker paper for this just because, well, I'll tell you in a little bit. And also have a variety of markers or colored pencils. And I will often bring matches as well. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. So basically, this is just what it is. It's map making. So I talk with the children a little bit. I might even have a model of an example map that I made, just a very rudimentary map to show them that I made of the area. But I talk with them a little bit about looking around and being able to have a map to show what is around us. And we might do a little exploration and build the map together, depending on the age of the children. Or I might give each of them their own piece of heavy duty paper and materials to draw with and have them each draw their own map and then compare them to one another. Or even more advanced, you can add in a scavenger hunt component to this, have them hide something, and then they have to draw a map for someone else to be able to find the thing that they hid. So there are a variety of ways you can do this map making activity with children just depending on their skill level. So This activity is really great for visual scanning, for visual perception, for motor skills, fine motor skills, drawing skills. There's so much here, right? And and just really understanding their own sense of space, their own body in the place that they are in. I just love this activity so much. So when they are done with the drawing part of the map, this is the really fun part where you get to make them look like hardcore maps, like old fashioned maps. You can put them in the dirt, you can crumple them up a little bit. And then if you really want to make them look cool, you can bust out your matches and burn the edges to make them look old and and antique. So that's really fun. Kids love that you're going to do something a little bit scary. (laughs) Now do talk about fire safety, please. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But they they love the burning of the edges and then you can kind of stamp it out on the ground and like assuming that it's okay to have fires in your area. Of course, let's be fire safe, be fire safe. Anytime I talk about fire, you have to remember safety. I do talk with the kids about that, too. But it's just really fun and the kids love it. And I think it also serves the great purpose of just orienting children to space and place and really builds the foundation for them to find these these unique spaces in nature. So one of the things that is so cool about nature-based work is that children name the special places that they find out in nature. So there's a a place in where the park where we run some of our groups in California at my practice at Outdoor Kids OT where a giant tree fell over and the end of the tree that uprooted from the ground has been like covered with mud and dirt over the years and it's this giant like broccoli looking big mound of dirt where the dirt has gone over the roots and it's just kind of over time looks like a giant mound of broccoli and so they call it broccoli mountain and it's like they love to climb on it and go in the hole where the roots used to be in the ground so it's cool to see kids come up with these sweet places for their special sweet names for the the special places that they they have in nature and this map making activity can lay the foundation for them looking for spaces like that because it's orienting them to the space around them right away Okay, the third outdoor therapy activity that I absolutely love is fire building. And I always say that if you have a bad therapy session where just things didn't go the way you wanted to, or the kids weren't engaged, or your plan fell apart, or there was a lot of conflict, or whatever it is, right? Because this is therapy that we're doing, and there are days that are like that. (laughs) Sometimes things don't go as planned, and you just have a hard day with kids. So fire building is the next thing you should do. (laughs) Because it's just so engaging. I'm, I've almost never found a kid that is not engaged. I have had kids who are a little fearful at first, but they're a little scared, but they're really engaged. They're paying attention. They're interested because it's activity that actually involves a very real risk. And our kids today don't have enough opportunities to experience that real risk. And so this is something novel that they don't usually get to experience in daily life. This is something I talk about in the Contigo Approach course where novelty is so necessary in our sessions. So being allowed to build a fire is really exciting. And I could probably do a whole episode on this. So I will try to control myself and maybe do all about fire building episode in the future. But I love how I'm coming up with ideas for other episodes as I'm doing these episodes. But 
for now, I just want to say a few things that it's really important, as I mentioned previously when I talked about matches and fire or in map making, you really, really need to make sure you have the fire safety conversation with children and make sure the kids are developmentally ready to do fire building before you introduce this activity with them. So typically when I have done fire building in sessions, it is part of a larger activity where maybe we're building a fire and then we're making food on top of that fire. It doesn't mean that you can't do fire building just as a standalone activity, but it adds another element when you're serving a functional purpose with your fire building and you make different snacks or cook things that you can eat over the fire. So there are a few of those in my book, Therapy in the Great Outdoors, which is on Amazon. It has 44 different outdoor activities for children that can be used in nature-based therapy sessions. And the whole reason that I compiled the activities in that book and published it was because I was frustrated with some of the books out there. We've all seen them, the four school activity books or outdoor activity books that had these extremely detailed and highly challenging activities that might be easier to execute in a forest school program where maybe you're seeing kids five days a week for six hours a day. And the kids have in those programs, let's be real, like typically there are mostly neurotypical children in those programs who can sustain attention and have the fine motor skills and gross motor skills to be able to do these activities and who have the stamina to persevere when things are really hard. And so, you know, I felt like a lot of those activities were were really challenging to modify for typically shorter therapy sessions, might be one or two hours in length, and to modify them for kids who did have attention challenges or did have motor skill challenges. So that's the whole purpose of my book is that the activities are simple and easier to execute in a one to two hour session with children and with children who may have some challenges in different developmental areas. So there are some snacks in my book that you can cook over the fire that are fun and really simple to do if you're interested. Okay, so fire building. Of course, you want to have the safety conversation with children. And part of that conversation is getting kids to come up with the ideas. You're you're not going to be giving them a list of three things to remember when we do fires or anything like that, you're going to facilitate a conversation with them about fire. Like, what do they already know about fire? You're going to ask them to do the problem solving, them to come up with the ideas so that I I really, this is something I'm really big on too in the Contigo Approach course. I talk about this is putting the problem solving back to the child, okay? So encouraging them to think and encouraging them to come up with their own ideas and problem solve themselves rather than just giving them answers because our kids get preached to way too much in our modern educational system. So giving them the ability to really think through what is happening when you have that conversation about fire safety. So you might write some things down and give them visuals and be very clear with them about what the expectations are, but make sure that the children are actively engaged in that pre-teaching before you do any kind of fire building activity in your therapy sessions. So after that, you can have them gather materials for the fire so you can show them different sizes of materials or different things that are in your environment that can be used to start a fire and then have them go look for those materials. So this is great for visual scanning, for visual discrimination, visual processing, getting some gross motor movement in, moving up and down to pick things up, collecting things. So looking around your area. And this is this is a great activity, too, for getting to know the area that you're in. All the while, you're building this connection to nature because you're allowing the children to interact with the natural environment by collecting those, those materials that are naturally occurring materials in nature. So there's a sensory and tactile element to that as well. Now you're ready to actually start the fire. So you may teach children how to build different setups for a fire. So you can do like a log cabin or a teepee formation with the sticks and the the kindling and tinder. Again, this could be a whole episode in and of itself. I'm realizing I need to make some notes and do a fire building episode. But I'll just say here that my two favorite ways of starting a fire are either matches or a ferro rod. So I'll talk a little bit about these. So using matches, 
I really like for kids that have fine motor challenges, I really like the very long matches. They're like fireplace matches. You can get them at any drugstore. They're like, I don't know, eight inches long maybe, and they're really thick. So they allow the child to strike the match without having their fingers so close to where the flame is on like the typical tiny little one and a half inch or two inch matches that we we usually use, the regular matches. So those long fire starter matches are great. And it's a great bilateral activity to hold the box and learn to strike the match you're working on. It works on body awareness, shoulder stability, visual attention, really, really works on visual attention. Paying attention is so important with fire building. And that's one reason I love this activity so much because there's so many skills here. And this is not an exhaustive list just off the top of my head. But those matches are really great and, yeah, build a lot of skills with kids. Okay, the second way of starting the actual fire that I love is to have kids use a ferro rod. It's F-E-R-R-O. You can look these up on Amazon and see a variety of different ones. And if you want to know the one that we use in my practice, you can go to amazon.com slash shop slash Outdoor Kids OT, and you'll see the specific ones that we use because we tried a lot of different ones and not all of them work as well as others. But basically what this is, is a metal rod that you strike to make sparks that then light the materials on fire. And it's really cool to use with kids. Kids are super motivated by this, works on a lot of the same skills that I just mentioned when striking a match. We actually have a whole video on fire starting using a ferro rod inside of the Contigo Approach online course. That's something that we taught at the retreat that I did years ago, and it just is so fun to do with kids. So that is something to explore as well and consider using in your nature-based treatment sessions. So that's it. Giant spider web, map making, and fire building. Those are three of my most favorite activities to do with children out in nature. If you want to find a variety of nature-based pediatric therapy activities, join the Therapy in the Great Outdoors free community. We have a crowdsourced list there where lots of nature-based therapists are sharing their favorite activities to do with children as well. So this is not just about what I love, but about what all of you love too. So join us and feel free to share your own activities there that you have tried as well as check out what other nature-based pediatric therapists all around the world are doing as well. I will see you there. Thank you so much for spending time with me today, exploring therapy in the great outdoors. If you liked what you heard in this episode, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes so we can share the magic of nature-based therapy with a wider audience of therapists who work with children, children who desperately need connection to nature nowadays, just like we do. If you're ready to take the next step in this adventure, join our free Therapy in the Great Outdoors community at therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com. The Tigo community is a private space just for nature-based pediatric practitioners. We have loads of resources there to support you as you start or grow a nature-based practice or program. Our free Tigo community has a discussion forum, a jobs and volunteers board, a crowdsourced treatment activities section, as well as free video trainings, research article reviews, and book recommendations from yours truly. Head on over to therapyinthegreatoutdoors.com to join today. So until next time, get outside, connect, reflect, and enjoy the business and practice of therapy in the great outdoors. 